From civil rights pioneers to military service equality and school desegregation, WCDX honors black history with a special presentation, Hidden History. Sponsored by the University Auto Family of Dealerships and Alexander Shannara, personal injury attorneys. Hello and welcome to Hidden History. We're taking a look at some events in black history rarely discussed, which impact the lives here in Alabama and around the entire United States. African Americans have made great contributions to our country for centuries. Sure, you may know about Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X along with Rosa Parks, but what about the other names that you don't know? During the next 60 minutes, we're looking at some of black history's hidden moments. Let's begin our journey. The Lee sisters of Memphis, Tennessee were pioneers of the civil rights movement. More than 50 years later, they remain proud of their title as the most arrested civil rights family in the United States. Their only crime standing up against racial injustices by sitting in at libraries and lunch counters. Rudy Williams reveals the hidden history behind this socially conscious family. Nobody questions, should we do this? You know, it was less when, let's do it. We spoke with Brenda Lee Turner, Peggy Jane Lee and Elaine Lee Turner, three of the seven Lee sisters, together with sisters Sandra Lee Swift, Joan Lee Nelson, Ernestine Lee Henning, and the late Susan Lee, they were arrested 17 times between 1960 and 1966. We grew up in an environment where there was a close family and um, we talked about how things should be and were not and that if we ever got a chance to make a difference, we would do that. That chance came in 1960. The eldest sister, Ernestine Lee, led her sisters into the civil rights fight when she joined schoolmates from Lemoyne College in Memphis during a sit-in at one of the city's white-only libraries. We knew we were ready for that. With their parents' support, the Lee sisters would spend the next six years marching, picketing, and sitting in. We had picketed so many times. I mean, picketing was just what we did all the time. The Lee sisters have been lauded as pioneers of the civil rights movement in Memphis, honored with trophies from various organizations, including an historic marker aptly placed on Main Street in downtown Memphis, where they helped integrate lunch counters. As we sat down, they would put clothes signs on the restaurant uh, counter and then we'd move on to the other one. They put clothes there, but we would just make our rounds from one to the other to the next one. The Lee sisters knew change had to happen soon. I felt that we had a certain amount of power uh, because we were on the side of right. They knew we were right, but they nevertheless had to hold on to these old ideas. You would see a truck roll by with white men on it with guns, and so it, 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 it impacted me that this was a serious thing that was going on. And that there were actually people who were ready to kill us. And when they looked at us uh, and hurled insults at us, they meant it. Being arrested was one thing, but the possibility of being killed for what they believed was another. Our parents were, were believed in God and strong faith in God, and I knew they were Prayerful. They, they understood the danger even more than we did because of their growing up. They leaned on the prayers and faith of their parents because their legacy required them to speak out and take action. So we just stepped on out each day like this is our mission and uh, it was our time to do this. I had no fear during those times. Uh, the only thing that I thought they were going to do was arrest me and uh, that was no problem as far as I was concerned. A change was going to come to Memphis. The Lee sisters say they would do it all over again. Sisters Elaine Lee Turner and Joanne Lee Nelson co-founded Heritage Tours and Slave Haven Museum in Memphis, where they teach visitors from around the world black history year round. The civil rights movement came to the forefront of America in the 1950s and 60s with events like the Montgomery bus boycott and the epic events that happened in Selma, Alabama. But before those events occurred, an African-American couple in Florida was fighting for equality and ultimately paid the price in the end. Rod Carter has a story. Before Martin, before Medgar, there were the Moors. Harry T. and Harriet V. Moore. The Moores were married civil rights activists from Mims, Florida, a tiny town along the Space Coast. It's just east of Orlando. On December 25th, 1951, 
someone placed sticks of dynamite underneath the front porch of their modest shotgun home. That was the bomb that was heard around the world. Harry T. Moore passed away that day, and Harriet died nine days later. Harry Moore was the secretary of the NAACP. He routinely registered black voters. He stood up and spoke out against lynchings. It's about 12 acres. William Gary has dedicated the last several years of his life to this, the Harry T. and Harriet Moore Memorial Park and Museum. This was all orange groves out here. There's a replica of their home, complete with an icebox, wood-burning stove. Uh, the radio that, uh, you know, they had touches of 1951. At the Moore Museum, take a brief walk through African American history. And it's a very emotional thing with me. It's been more than 66 years since that bomb exploded here in Brevard County. A bomb blast that everyone says was so loud it could be heard for miles and miles away. And to this day, no one's ever been brought to justice. In Mims, Florida, I'm Rod Carter. Up next on Hidden History, we'll take a journey to Old Town Huntsville and see how this lovely home played a major role in the Underground Railroad. That's coming up next on Hidden History. Welcome back. The Lowry House is one of the oldest homes in Huntsville and is now used for things like weddings and special events. The house, which is located in the Lincoln Mill area, is one of the only homes in the South with a specific Italian style of architecture. But our Rebecca Petit shows us that there is much more to this historic house than meets the eye. This room right here was the most important room in the house. This 19th century home on Kildare Street was built by John Tate Lowry around 1850. Lowry constructed this home with wood from the original cabin that was built by his grandfather in the early 1800s. The home is now owned by oh, Jane geez. and Louis Tippett, who bought oh, it in 1998 one. and renovated it. That we found in the yard. Mrs. Tippett we gives public the tours place. of the home dressed okay. as Elizabeth Tate, John Lowry's mother. All the doors, all the windows that are still here, all the hard work, and the stairwells, everything is original to the house. Lowry was a wealthy farmer and businessman. He owned many slaves that worked on his plantation. It was during the 1860s that Lowry went against societal norms and became an abolitionist. He saw that, that there was a need to help his fellow man. Lowry allowed his home to become part of the Underground Railroad to help slaves escape. A secret room that he had upstairs, which is off his, which was off of his bedroom, and that's where they were hidden. He was very methodical when he reconstructed this house. This is more than 100 years old, and they do not squeak when you walk on. He purposely made the stairs out of chestnut and oak. Do you hear them squeaking? They built a staircase where they could bring slaves in and out at any time if they had guests. The guests couldn't hear in those two rooms there, couldn't hear the slaves being transported up and down the staircase. Once the slaves made it quietly up the stairs, they would walk through the master bedroom and then hide inside this 24 by 24 room. More than 100 of them confined, not making a sound. Lowry helped slaves who were using the Underground Railroad communicate with each other by using a secret code language. Reading and writing was forbidden for a slave to be able to do. So they had to have some way of communication. They would hang quilts, which contained signals, and that would tell when and how to go, who to speak to, and that type of thing. Right here is a basket, and that would tell you, you to take enough food and supplies when you go. Underground Railroad code was also used in the way slaves dressed. If she wore a red scarf tied to the front, it would mean danger, don't talk to me. If she wore a yellow scarf tied to the back, caution, you may speak to me if it's clear. If she wore a white scarf tied to the front, it meant you can talk to me freely. And while washing clothes and laboring in the fields, the slaves were planning their escape. If, if the trousers were hung with the legs up in the air, that means prepare the run. If they hung with the trousers legs hanging down by the waist, 
stand fast, don't run in danger. Historian Bob Hayden gives tours of the historic Lowry House. He grew up just blocks away from it, but never knew what the inside looked like. I couldn't come because of the racial policy. Then one day, his friend Louis Tippett told him he bought the home. It was one of the greatest things in my life, it'd be for sure my daughter and granddaughter, where our civil rights started. That our friends are the people who restored and saved it for historical value for future generations. They didn't knock it down. They saved it. In Huntsville, Rebecca Petit, WZDX News. Coming up, a recent discovery near Mobile Bay may provide an answer to a 157-year-old mystery. See that story next on Hidden History. It could be one of the most significant historical finds along the Alabama Gulf Coast in years. What could be the remains of the last known ship to bring slaves from Africa to America is believed to have been discovered in the Delta near Mobile, Alabama. Bill Riles has more. Environmental and investigative reporter Ben Raines believes this is the resting place of the Clotilda, the last ship to bring slaves from Africa to North America. You know, we've got an old ship in the right place. And while other things need to be verified, Rain says he definitely believes it is the Clotilda. It's circumstantial at this point. Um, we won't know anything concrete until, you know, they dig in, literally dig it up. In a story for AL.com, Rain said he took a shipwright and two archaeologists to the site he discovered about two weeks ago when a cold north wind brought an extremely low tide, exposing the wood and metal indicative of the mid-1850s when the Clotilda was made. He believes there may be much more of the ship preserved in the mud. You might still have all the inner uh, construction down there, which would have included the pens where they had the captives, um, manacles. We might find, um, you know, casks of different supplies. The Clotilda arrived in Mobile with as many as 160 slaves, but federal authorities caught wind of the illegal venture. The captain offloaded his cargo onto a riverboat and set Clotilda ablaze and adrift. The Africans went into slavery in various locations, but after the Civil War, they were freed. A group asked one Mobile landowner, Timothy Mayer, for some land. That group settled here in what they called Africatown. A lot of the survivors of the Clotilda are buried here. This is the old part of the Plateau Africatown Cemetery. And those survivors include the last known survivor of the Clotilda, Cudjo Lewis. What I hope is finding the ship, if this is it, gives people uh, a reason, one, to, to you know investigate a little more, to pay attention to Africatown. Rain says he hopes archaeology work on the ship can begin soon. In 1997, the movie Amistad told the story of a historic slave uprising aboard a ship that led to a long legal battle that was tried by U.S. President John Quincy Adams. Today, a replica of the ship can be found in Connecticut. It's used to educate its visitors. The Amistad was never meant to be a slave ship, but in 1839 off the coast of Cuba, that's what it became. Like many slave ships, in humane conditions. It wasn't long before the captives revolted. Led by Sengbe P.A., they took back the ship. He's your average everyday farmer from Mende land. He's one of these ordinary people that's put in an extraordinary uh, circumstance, and he rises to the occasion. He becomes the hero of the story. Today, Connecticut's mystic seaport, a replica of the Amistad, sails again. Part of the Discovering Amistad initiative. It sits in a harbor not far from New London, where it eventually ended up over 175 years ago. The Africans find themselves in a legal battle, even defended by former President John Quincy Adams. The highly publicized case made its way all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. But ultimately they decided they're from Africa, and as free men who had been kidnapped, they had every right to defend themselves and free themselves. And so the Supreme Court ultimately decided that they should be set free. The court victory did not end slavery, far from it. The Amistad case actually didn't have that big of an impact on Supreme Court law, on precedent, but it was a symbolic case. But it did provide hope. To tell us that progress is possible, that, that we can keep moving forward. Hope that's revisited every time the ship sets sail and the story of Amistad is told. Reporting at Mystic Seaport, Scott McDonald. Coming up, we'll introduce you to an extraordinary man who served as a Tuskegee Airman during three wars and then went on to have a career in academia. Stay with us. Welcome back. There's a small group of living veterans who have served in three major wars, and one of them is a Tuskegee Airman. Amy Simpson introduces us to a great American hero. 
Colonel Porcher Taylor Jr. is a remarkable and decorated war hero, calling Petersburg home for the past 40 years. I have a patriotic spot in my heart for this country of ours. But he says decades in the military didn't come without its challenges. This country, in the beginning, was not very nice to me or anybody who looked like me. Taylor's service spanned three wars, World War II, Korea, and Vietnam, worn like badges of honor on his hat. He says he only feared death one time, when he was put behind a machine gun in Guam that he hadn't been trained on. That's a dangerous weapon. You can kill a whole lot of people. He says he wasn't trained on this heavy artillery because he was a black man. Serving before and during the civil rights movement, Taylor says he worked to empower and promote African Americans in the military. When I first came in as an enlisted man, and then later as an officer, the big difference was, I suppose, as an officer, I could do something about it because I was in charge. Taylor left the military after three decades, going on to have a successful career in academia. He was one of the first black men to earn a Ph.D. from University of South Carolina, served as vice president at VSU, founded the Petersburg chapter of the Tuskegee Airmen, even wrote a book. Despite the accolades and legacy apparent to his family and community, he remains humble and kind. I'm 92 and I don't have too much time left. I'm not stupid enough not to believe that. The National Museum of African American History and Culture is working to preserve the stories of some families who paid the ultimate sacrifice. D.C. correspondent Bree Jackson tells us about these significant figures in history. The National Museum of African American History and Culture tells America's story through the eyes of African Americans, like Medal of Honor recipient Cornelius Charlton and his family. Charlton died serving our country and his parents joined a distinct group known as Gold Star Families. And, Curator Kowalski uh, Salter says it started as a way to recognize mourning families. Born out of World War I by mothers who had lost sons, actually born out of a desire to have something perhaps tangible to their loss. World War I was one of the deadliest conflicts in U.S. history and the bodies of many soldiers never returned home. In an effort to help console loved ones, in the early 1930s, the federal government sponsored trips for Gold Star families to visit the graveyards abroad. But that program came with controversy caused by racial segregation. And some of the mothers decided that they were going to boycott going to the uh, pilgrimages because they felt that their sons had fought for democracy and equality, and yet 11 years later when they were going on these pilgrimages, the pilgrimages were going to be uh, segregated. While some objected, more than 160 African-American Gold Star families did go to the grave sites to honor their fallen husbands and sons. And Salter says it's not only important to recognize all the men and women who made the ultimate sacrifice, but also the Gold Star families they leave behind. Up next on Hidden History, I spent some time at a local church whose history is just as old as Alabama statehood. That's coming up next. Religion plays a strong role in the lives of many Alabama residents, primarily because the state is located in the heart of the Bible Belt. The next stop on the Hidden History Tour takes us to a church whose foundation has been so strong through numerous generations. Every Sunday in the Tennessee Valley, multiple things occur during a typical service at an African-American Baptist church. There's praise and worship, fellowship, and you'll also hear a good sermon. Like many, St. Bartley Primitive Baptist Church holds services every Sunday, and one thing that sets them apart from others is its longevity. So to understand the history of St. Bartley, you need to step out of the sanctuary and into a place like this, a cemetery, which is commonly known as a place for deceased loved ones. St. Bartley's roots begin here in what used to be the Georgia Cemetery during the antebellum era of the South. Not only was the cemetery a place to honor deceased loved ones, but it was also a focal point of the black community because slaves actually claimed this place as their own. Those people had to be dedicated. Um, and they had to be not afraid because back then, if you were a slave, you 
probably really didn't meet in a place, in a public place. William Harris, a slave himself, preached multiple sermons in this graveyard, and by 1820, Harris organized the Huntsville African Baptist Church, making it the oldest African-American congregation in the state of Alabama. Unfortunately, there are no pictures of Harris, but members of the current church depict him as legendary. He was a big man with a lot of courage and a lot of faith to start a church in a graveyard. That's, that's phenomenal, that's mind blowing. By the time he left the pulpit, another man who had already staked his claim as a Huntsville legend away from the church has stepped up to lead the church to new heights. The Bartley Harris, who came after William Harris, actually played a position in the Civil War um, and that he uh, joined in with the Confederate Army uh, in hiding weapons. And the Union Army came along and actually burned down the church because he hid weapons. During Reconstruction, Bartley Harris moved the Huntsville African Baptist Church from the Georgia Cemetery to Oak Avenue, which is now present-day Williams Avenue. Not only did the church have a change in location, it also got an upgraded name. He was so well known in the community, so the community just considered him as a saint. So they would refer to the church as St. Bartley's Church. So that's kind of how we went to the name of St. Bartley after Huntsville African Baptist Church. Baptisms are a big part of every religion, and the baptisms that were done by Elder Bartley Harris were big, literally. According to church records, Harris baptized more than 3,000 members in the waters of Big Spring Park on Baptism Sunday, making it a must-see event. If you look at the pictures, they were in buggies and horses and had umbrellas. So it was a big, big event for the city of Huntsville. Another brush with history that involves St. Bartley is its role in the Indian Creek Primitive Baptist Association, in which it is known as the Mother Church. So yes, we do have, I would say, a lot of congregations around the country that are looking in and seeing what St. Bartley is doing and being inspired by our work. During the course of nearly two centuries, St. Bartley has seen its fair share of change, from locations to leadership, from slavery to civil rights. St. Bartley's current pastor, James Mooney, believes that the church has survived and thrived as Alabama's oldest African-American congregation because of grace and mercy. This church has remained a strong place in this community, and for that, we're grateful that God has allowed us to do that. The church is 197 years old. That's great. That's wonderful. But what's even greater is, is the Word of God never changed. There's more hidden history coming up on WZDX. When we return, we'll learn about the Orange Mound community in Memphis and see how it's withstood the test of time. Now let's head to Memphis, Tennessee, to the first community in the United States built by and for African Americans. Annette Fiegler spoke to the community's most prominent members about the hidden history behind this hidden jewel. There was so much love, so much innovation, so much community unity here. Mary Jones Mitchell is referring to her community, the Southeast Memphis neighborhood known as Orange Mound. In the 1890s, the Dedrick family sold the land to LZ Meacham for $100. Meacham then sold the land to African Americans living in Memphis. It's the first community in America founded and developed exclusively for African Americans to buy land and own their own home. Black business owners, doctors, and lawyers built homes in the neighborhood over the following decades. By the 1940s and 50s, it was a thriving African American community. We know that this place was just rich with jewels. 81-year-old Jones Mitchell vividly remembers how it endured the civil rights years. We had uh, meetings, we had marches, we had voters registration. Orange Mount Civic Club was dynamic in getting people to uh, uh, vote. Mitchell says the churches in Orange Mound were a place of refuge during segregation in the civil rights movement. One of those churches was Mount Pisgah CME Church. We believe that from a holistic perspective that we have a responsibility not just to build big, big buildings and, and continue to expand without giving back to the community. The church burned down on the first Sunday of the year in 1948. To this day, no one knows what caused the fire. I remember standing outside watching. I remember my mother was crying. The church rebuilt and is now the second oldest church in Orange Mound. Lillian Bumpus has been a member for 82 years. 
it has really served as an anchor because so many of the children come back. But with every great success story comes a struggle. During the 1980s and 90s, Orange Mound started to go downhill. A lot of property became rental property. Many people have bought in the community, but they are not living here. Revitalization efforts started in 2000 and included building a new Orange Mound Community Center. Second group. Seniors can now enjoy dancing, playing cards, and shooting pool. Joyce Shaw teaches theater. It was like tapping into old dreams. They were very active in high school with the theater department or something. And most recently, the community welcomed its first art gallery. Two years ago, this was an abandoned liquor store. Jones Mitchell says for those who were born and raised here, there's something special that binds them together. You likely ate a hot dog from Miss Bradley's, enjoyed live music at Handy Theater, and graduated from Melrose High School. We dominated football in the, in the city and in the state in the 50s and the 60s. And it's that camaraderie that keeps this neighborhood thriving. Up next, find out how a cultural center in Knoxville is preserving the past in a very unique way. Soon, many of the people who lived through some of America's earlier racial struggles of civil rights will pass on. Their stories documented in many books. Tirsa Smith takes a look at one cultural center's mission in Knoxville, Tennessee, to preserve the voices of generations gone on in their own words. The Beck Cultural Exchange Center is in the business of preserving the legacy of Knoxville's African American history. So in addition to learning history, to reading about history, I think there's this whole idea of experiencing history. Digging through these old tapes of interviews from the late 70s of blacks in the community, each telling another side of the city's history. When I came to Knoxville, the night August the 16th, 1916. It brings to life some of the forgotten stories of suffering, survival, and success of a generation gone on. They were pretty up in age when they were being interviewed, and so we get a chance to really kind of look back on history and hear the voices of those people um, and their take on what life was like all those years ago. Some of the stories are about everyday life. John B. Wheeler was the son of a sharecropper who would go on to help run one of the few black funeral homes in Knoxville. And I came back to Nashville and my brother had opened the A.R. Wheeler and Son funeral home. And I started to working for him in 19 and 25. But the stories also tell of terrifying times. So we had the race riots here in the summer of 1919, August of 1919. It was a very hot summer and it felt like temperatures were just very hot as well. Mary Etter remembers the hours before her husband Joe, a veteran of the Spanish-American War, was killed in the streets of Knoxville during the Red Summer race riots that started in the local jail. Said a colored man killed a white woman. And that's what started out. He is a soldier anyhow, and he said at the race route, he told me it's going to be one. He told you that? He told me that. Knoxville education icon Sarah Moore Green shared stories of her father's childhood and the day he gained freedom from slavery in 1863 while in Kentucky. The day that they were, the Emancipation Proclamation was signed, that he called, uh, that Miss Rachel called him in and said they were out in the field playing just like children none of the other. He was the youngest of the, of the children because he was 10, but he remembered it very well. And this daughter of a slave would go on to do great things for the children of East Tennessee, becoming the first black person elected to the Knoxville Board of Education during integration. I said, now you don't have any communication. And I said, and I think, I, I really think you all need me. So when I left the stage that night, it was a white lady came up to me and she said, Miss Green, she says, I'm going to vote for you. And I said, well, I hope you will. Her impact still felt decades later while a local elementary school bears her name. And now the young students who go there will get to hear her stories one day. More than 40 oral histories were recorded at the Beck Cultural Exchange. They will go on permanent display at the Beck in late February. When we return on Hidden History, we'll learn about Abraham Lincoln's barber and meet some of his descendants. Stay with us.
Before he was an American president, Abraham Lincoln was a soft-spoken lawyer who walked the dusty streets of Springville, Illinois with his friends. And one of Lincoln's friends was a black man from Haiti. William Floreville cut Lincoln's hair and Lincoln was his lawyer. Now Floreville's family, they still live in Springfield, Illinois, just a few miles where both men are buried. Mark Maxwell has their story. In the early part of the 1900s, um, Someone said that only two people knew Lincoln best, William Herndon, his law partner, and uh, William Florville, his barber. They met in New Salem in the 1830s and formed an unlikely bond, a black immigrant from Haiti and a lanky lawyer from Kentucky. Florville moved around, Lincoln moved around, but they always knew one another by face, by name, by business, by friendship. Both embarking on a new life, both setting up shop in Springfield probably saw him every week, either on the street here or going into Florville's Barbershop, which was about a half a block away from the Lincoln Herndon Law Office. They swapped jokes, traded books, and both got married by the same reverend. Lincoln's wife grew up owning slaves. Florville's wife was one. Phoebe uh, Roundtree Florville, um, she had once been enslaved, his wife, so for, and I'm not sure how she uh, escaped from that in, enslavement, but she could have been taken or re-enslaved if she had been a runaway, runaway slave. National politics, a civil war, even 800 miles couldn't separate two old friends. William Florville is one of the few people in Springfield who wrote Lincoln a letter while he was president just to say hi as an old friend. One month after Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, Florville wrote the president, the shackles have fallen and bondmen have become free men. But the struggles of the Florville family were far from over. It is truly a tragedy. His grandson, George Richardson, was the man that Maybell Hellum, the um, woman that said she was a, a raped and attacked by an African-American man, um, he was the, uh, William Florville's grandson. He, he did tell stories, you know, about the riots. Norm Willis grew up hearing his grandfather's stories about the 1908 race riots that led to the start of the NAACP. It was probably really scary times and he uh, survived it thanks to some friends of his and just amazing to, to hear that something like that happen right here in Springfield. Norm's mom, Irene, still lives in the same house in Springfield, a direct descendant of William Florville. We were the only colored family the size of old couple that lived across the street. She recalls what life was like for a young married couple in the 1950s. Well, it wasn't too very good until we finally got to talking to people and I'm telling them where I lived and you let you mean you live there? but then and they said well you don't look like you should live there. Her great grandchildren still live in Springfield, a city just as much theirs as it was President Lincoln's. I've had a wonderful life, and, uh, and, I, and I learned how to treat people. Abraham Lincoln once said, I'm a success today because of a friend I had who believed in me and I didn't have the heart to let him down. Now, we don't know who he was talking about, but we do know that William Florville had a friend in the president, a friend who believed in him and never let him down. Powerful. Up next, we'll wrap up our Hidden History Project with a trip to New Orleans, the birthplace of jazz. The musical contributions of Louisiana's African-American community play a rich part in United States history. The culture of Louisiana itself moves to its rhythms. And African-Americans greatly influenced the Louisiana music scene from jazz to blues to present day hip hop. Justin Campbell explains how the music is making an impact with everyday life. Our story begins at Jackson Square in New Orleans, across the street from the Mississippi River. All this music that we playing out here, it come from slavery days, you know, it's just like what our forefathers and everything brung from Africa to the streets of New Orleans. And well, if you know, if you look, if you look Miami, you can see the Mississippi River, and that's where all the slaves used to get off the boats at. Kenny Terry blowing his trumpet along with his band members beating their drums and playing the tuba loud and proud at Jackson Square. 
And this is what we do to, uh, to keep our culture, our culture going in uh, throughout New Orleans, you know what I'm saying? They're mainly playing New Orleans jazz music, also known as Dixieland. Jazz replaced ragtime music. The new jazz music had an African-based rhythmic pattern, such as stomping and clapping, a West African influence, and a European classical music entwined. The music originated by African Americans, which emerged out of New Orleans and took over at the turn of the 20th century. It's a mixture of uh, Dixieland, jazz, all that, at, at the same time. It's a mixture of them. Louis Armstrong inspired me, and it's, it's important because it, it helps me uh, become a better person in life. But before ragtime or jazz stars like Louis Armstrong, the music of Louisiana started with slaves. I'm standing in Congo Square here in Louis Armstrong Park in New Orleans, where as many as 500 to 600 enslaved Africans would come here and congregate on the Sunday afternoons in the 1700s all the way up into the 1800s, where they would dance, sing, drum, and make music to what we now know as present-day African-American music. They brought their own music. They brought their own instruments. Mike Shepard, president and managing member of the Louisiana Music Hall of Fame in Baton Rouge, says blues, swing, and jazz all originated in Congo Square. That has been a tradition down there since the 1600s, since Congo Square opened that up and brought the rhythmic blends that New Orleans became famous for. In musical contributions of African Americans in Louisiana, from Congo Square didn't stop there. It really made the music of the whole United States. And everything came from that. The rock and roll, everything except the country. Kenneth Terry and his band at Jackson Square plan to carry on their forefathers' musical contributions. What we do is we keep the music alive. Today, hip hop has replaced jazz and blues as the voice of young African Americans. In New Orleans, I'm Justin Campbell. Great music, and we want to thank you for taking this journey with us. We hope you learned a lot about the hidden history moments that occurred both locally and nationally. Although we've highlighted just a few, there's still hundreds, maybe thousands of moments waiting to be discovered, and those are moments that might be able to be looked upon next year for our Hidden History Project. We want to thank you once again for joining us. I'm Mo Carter. And I'm Jen Jacobson. Thank you for joining us. WCDX News special presentation, Hidden History, has been sponsored by the University Auto Family of Dealerships and Alexander Shannara, personal injury attorneys.